so first off, uh, uh, maybe introduce yourself to to our to our uh, viewers and readers. Uh, tell us a little about yourself and, and what you're uh, running for. Sure. My name is Robert Sarvis. I'm the Libertarian candidate for governor. I am trying to give voters a better option from the major party candidates. My my vision for Virginia is one that's open-minded and open for business. I'm here to protect both economic freedom and personal liberty, to get the rule of law back into government, and to give consumers, uh, well, to, to root out a lot of the special exemptions and, and special treatment that moneyed interests get out of the government, and return us to, to serving the, the average voter. You have an interesting background from, from uh, law to software development, uh, master's degree in economics, and you have a lot of different things to bring to the table. Maybe talk about your, your background, how you think it influences your campaign. Sure. I think that Virginians have an opportunity here to focus our public policy on real solutions, substantive solutions, and, and preparing Virginia for all the challenges we're going to face over the next generation. That means economic competition, technological change. I'm the youngest of the three candidates. I have an exp I have background, professional and educational, in the tech sector. I have uh, I'm the only person who studied economics, and I have a very strong background in law as well and public policy. So I think I have a unique uh, offering for voters who believe that it's important to get government back where it's supposed to be, which is working for the good of the public interest, not for private profits. We, we'll talk about some issues in, in a moment, but just being a, a third-party candidate is very difficult. I know you've had difficulty, to say the least, in, in getting included in debates, uh, getting attention for the campaign and the issues you're trying to raise. Talk about that struggle and, and how uh, you aim to overcome that the next couple of months. Well, it's really about getting the message out. Um, as, as I go around the state, I put 8,500 8, miles on my van touring the state, and everywhere I go, there's elation at the fact that people are going to have a third option this year. And it really speaks to the failure of the Republican and Democratic parties. And I think that in the very first decision that one makes in running for governor, I made the best decision of the three of us, which is to not run as a Republican and not run as a Democrat. And so I think that we can, as voters, we can really make a difference this election, do something special, which is to reject that status quo and work on freedom under the rule of law and real solutions for Virginians. And, and there are parts to the libertarian philosophy that appeal to both Democrat voters or people who think of themselves as Democratic voters That's right. and those who think of themselves as Republican voters. Maybe talk about that if you could. Sure. It's, it's a, a third-party governor is in a position to get the best ideas from both parties without getting the worst ideas of either. And so I think that I, I have, better than either of the other candidates, an opportunity to work with both parties and work for solutions that, that really work for Virginia. Uh, some of the issues that have come up in Virginia politics in the last several months, uh, one, maybe the first one we can address would be the transportation compromise that sure. uh, the governor pushed through, had support of, of both Democrats and Republicans. Your thoughts on that? I think it's a real opportunity to do something special and to, and to sort of rationalize our transportation policy. I think we failed to do that. It's important to get more spending on something as important as transportation, but we did it in a way that doesn't solve a lot of the problems. So one issue is that one issue is that we failed to address the fact that we have this centralized bureaucracy that's deciding so much for what local and regional projects get funded. I don't think that's a very good way of doing it. Central planning is, is very inefficient, and it, it opens us up to a lot of um, special interest lobbying, uh, especially with the lack of transparency in the in the Department of Transportation. Uh, also, we moved away from. Uh, further away from a user pays type system where there's there's general funding from the sales tax. That's a regressive tax. There's a regional surtax. Um, a lot of people in poor areas might not even own cars, but now they're paying a substantially increased sales tax. There are a lot of taxes that are totally unrelated to roads um, that, that were also added. And particular, uh, particular things like uh, a, a charge for electric vehicles and a uh, you know 25 percent funding for mass transit it, it just stretches credulity to think that 140 legislators in Richmond know the precise percentage that's going to be most efficient for, for Virginia uh, so so what we should have done is move more towards a decentralized approach um, where, where local officials are, are empowered 
rather than central bureaucrats. Local officials are more accountable to people and they have more local knowledge about the relative merits of different projects. Could that be an issue really outside of even transportation? You talk about the, the decentralization perhaps of government. Virginia is a Dillon rule state. Localities really don't have a lot of flexibility to do what they need to do. I, from talking with a lot of members of city councils and board of supervisors over the years, they really feel constrained by Virginia's system. Is that something that could be a bigger issue to address in the future? I think so. I think that uh, you know, collecting all the reins of power in, in Richmond is a mistake. The Dillon rule, you know, I'm open-minded on that issue. I don't have a strong opinion. I do think that um, you do need to empower local jurisdictions, but you also need to make sure that those local jurisdictions can't be captured by special interests as well. Mm -hmm. Another issue, this is more of a, a federal politics issue that impacts the state, mm -hmm. but the uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act right. is going to be something that the next governor and the next general assembly will have to deal with uh, significantly. Talk about your thoughts on that. I think that the, uh, the ACA was a mistake. I think that Further federalization of the healthcare industry is, is moving in the wrong direction. The existing federal regulations are a major reason why we have such runaway spending. All the incentives are wrong, there's no price transparency whatsoever, spending is very inefficient. Uh, so so the, the ACA is going to make matters worse. I don't think that we should expand that role. Certainly, I think that what we should be doing is seeking waivers or, or, or changes to the, to the programs to create a lot more policy freedom at the state level. And what I'd like to see is us move away from the idea that insurance, health insurance is comprehensive and that we do so much funding through the insurance system. I think we should move to catastrophic insurance. Uh, so more of our health care, more of our public spending should be focused on mental health, uh, which has high returns to public spending. And then what the, the rest of what spending we do, uh, it would be better to do through cash subsidies. Uh, giving people more flexibility in in focusing the spending that's being done on them uh, on things that will be more individualized to their needs. The General Assembly last year in 2012 spent a lot of time focusing on social issues, uh, particularly the abortion issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also seen in the state uh, in, in recent years a, a constitutional amendment on the ballot regarding uh, marriage. Uh, that's right. Your thoughts on social issues and the role they should play in public policy? I think we should have uh, relative freedom in our private lives. I'm the only person who's willing to fight for that across the board. Um, I think the mis there were there were several mistakes that were made by the GOP. I, I think I, I'm I'm not trying to wade into the abortion uh, fight, but I do think that regardless of whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, I do think that the recent bills were a mistake on rule of law grounds and scope of government grounds. So I think those those were problematic, and I just think that you know when when the GOP is, is nominating a candidate who is for criminal enforcement of adultery laws, uh, resurrection of the crimes against nature, anti-sodomy laws, uh, somebody who wants to federalize the definition of marriage. I just think that's a mistake and that the GOP is, is uh, you know, no longer even, even uh, just totally not credible when it talks about freedom. Another freedom issue, perhaps, so talking about job creation, and you've talked mm -hmm. about how uh, the, the economic freedom is a really important part of your campaign. Talk about that, if you would. Right. The, mo the best thing that we can do to help the jobless rate uh, and, to, and to make sure that the economy is vibrant and robust and can move people from failing industries into rising industries is to have an open and competitive market where everybody can compete on a level playing field. Entrepreneurs, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, everybody should operate under the same rules. That means returning to the rule of law, getting rid of regulatory barriers to entry. Oftentimes regulations are used by market incumbents to protect them, insulate them from competition and protect their profits. And so we need to root out all of that. Uh, we need to simplify the tax code, get rid of a lot of business taxes that, are, that, uh, that create uh, dis disincentives to do business and disincentives to employ people. So there are a lot of things that we can do, that we should do. Uh, that can that can jumpstart the economy and jumpstart job creation, and we have to have somebody in Richmond who's willing to make, who's willing to go to Washington, go on go on the talk shows, go to Congress, and really make a sustained and economically intelligent argument for getting the federal government out of the way, so that states can that states can uh, have more policy freedom, that we can return to the rule of law across the board. So we're here taking advantage of a nice day uh, in, in, the, in the valley in August, a rare, a rare August day that feels like fall. Uh, we're here with the local backdrop of the downtown district here. 
Uh, you, you talked to earlier about your, your travels around Virginia mm -hmm. and how, how you're, you're, you're learning more about Virginia, I'm sure, as, as well as people are learning about you. Could you talk about just that, how that's, how that's, not only is it helping you to learn more about Virginia, but also you're getting your message out. I mean, this is, this is probably a very interesting thing to do to, to be able to see the state maybe in a different way. This is, yeah, this is absolutely great. I did some traveling as a kid around the state uh, for, for both family vacations and also academic competitions. But this is totally different, and, and, and it's, it's really enjoyable to, um, to meet people from all over the state. I've, I've, I've covered you know, vast, vast portions of the state and, and driven a lot of miles, but I hear the same thing everywhere, which is that government needs to get out of the way and that the Republican and Democratic parties uh, cannot be trusted with, with, with making that happen. Well, Robert Sarvis, Libertarian candidate for governor, thank you for your time today. Thank you.